through a timeline of the Bible. Um, we run it all the way up to the New Testament, and uh, there are a couple of things I mentioned the fullness of time of Paul's term. Uh, last week we talked a little bit about that, so we're going to hit that topic again today and then, and then conclude the study uh, of the timeline of the Bible. It's my intention next week, God willing, and everything will be planned, to be begin a new study of an epistle. I had contemplated and, and prepared to be James. Someone suggested to me an alternative, uh, which was Titus. And, and I'm not committing to either of those yet. I'm still willing to receive any input from anybody about the topic. So like I said, I'm, I'm prepared to do James. Uh, I'm not opposed to doing Titus, but I might flip it around and do James and then Titus, God willing. But the thought that came to me as I was reflecting on that is, Titus is one of the pastoral epistles. Paul wrote three letters, two to Timothy, one to Titus. And both of those men were trained by Paul and then appointed to train other pastors in different communities. Uh, Titus eventually ends up on the island of Crete, which, by the way, is providing the reason to Titus. All Cretans are liars. It was actually a statement that Crete said about each other. Everybody on Crete said everybody was a liar there. So Paul reminded Titus about that in his letter. Okay? But he didn't just work in Crete, but that's where he was appointed to work. And then Timothy was working in Asia Minor. He'd been in Ephesus um, and other places that Paul had gone as well. Both of them, for lack of a better label, would have been, today, would be seen as seminary professors, training other pastors. Okay? And so those three letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are called the pastoral epistles. They're about pastoral care, training pastors. So at any rate, uh, that's why I was thinking perhaps Titus would be an appropriate thing to take up since the you know, congregation is in the midst of the whole process. Um, and, and so I'm letting you reflect on that till the end of today, and then let me know as you go out the door, think about it, pray about it, call me during the week, but don't wait till Saturday, that's too late. <laughs> But like I said, I'm prepared to do James, but I can easily uh, do, Tim, uh, do Titus, okay? But I'm letting you make a choice about what you want to cover. Now, we generally get the bulletin printed on Thursday, and I put it in the bulletin. So if I get lots of input from you guys, it'll, you know, determine our, our topic. If I get limited or no input from you, I'll probably go with James, just so you guys understand that, okay? <coughs> Not that I'm opposed to Titus, it's just I'm prepared for James. Titus, I have to do a little bit more work, which means I've got to start sooner than Saturday, okay? All right. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, you have indeed called us to be your people, and you have set us free in Christ Jesus, to walk in your light. Bless us as we share your word and as we point others to Christ who is the light of the world, that they might know your peace and live in your house forever. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. This past week, uh, we have received in the mail, thanks to the efforts of the uh, office staff, the facial mask you see in front of you today. Thank goodness. You're much easier to understand now. That's encouraging. That's part of the objective, is to make it easier for you to understand me. The other thing I discovered speaking with Keith briefly after service was the microphone setting in church had to be adjusted because this pushes all the sound right down. And if there's a microphone right here, I have to talk a little less vigorously, and that's hard for me. <laughs> Talking was fine, singing was a little... A little, little too much? <laughs> you see no, it's good. Just... I'll keep singing like that. <laughs> uh, I said this previously, some of you remember me saying this. 
one of the greatest joys I, I had after I retired was I could go to church and sing all of the communion distribution hymns. Can't do that anymore. I still sing some of them, you may have noticed I do that. But it's, I'm sorry, I have to sing, I can't not do it. Okay. All right. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we had been talking last week about the fullness of time. I, I used the term the Pax Romana. You're familiar with that term? The peace that Rome brought. It imposed it really literally as an empire. It was a republic to begin with, and then the politicians became convinced of their own necessity of remaining in office, and so they manipulated elections and bribed people and killed opponents to stay in office. There is nothing new under the sun, just so you know, okay? And in the process of, of doing that, they moved from a republic to an empire and they had an emperor. But that is one of the reasons they had the peace they did, because the emperors came to power by controlling armies. If you were the governor of a Roman province, you were entitled to raise an army to govern the province. And if you were under attack, you were entitled to raise as many legions as you could raise to accomplish your purpose. One of the reasons Julius Caesar became so powerful, he was governor of Near Gaul and Tartar Gaul, and he raised armies to fight the rebellious tribes in those territories. Basically, he raised armies to expand his territory and get more power, luckily. But that resulted in, in a widespread stability in the Mediterranean area in Jesus' day. The other thing that was so important about the moment in history, we talked last week about Alexander the Great dying, and then his successors being his generals, the colonies in Egypt and the Seleucids, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, you may have heard that name before, who ruled over Palestine and Israel. Okay. The colonies in Egypt basically were not a big issue in, in Jesus' time, except for this. You might remember that the guy that worked with Anthony and Cleopatra was named Herod, and he was king. He was an Idumean, okay, which is a descendant uh, of the family of Abraham, uh, but not from Jacob, okay? And the Idumeans, were under the Seleucid branch, and the Egyptians were the Ptolemaic branch, and so Herod is king when Jesus is born. When Jesus is born, the king in Jerusalem is not from the house of David. And he is, well basically he's a paranoid schizophrenic. And he thinks everybody's out to take his kingdom, including some of his own relatives. If you read the history of the family of Herod, he and his sons as well, they were literally involved in, in fat, fratricide, killing their own family members to try to be king. So that when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the Magi come to visit, and Herod hears that a new king has been born, what is his immediate first response? Yeah. So he asks the Magi, in secret, nobody else is there, about what time did this star appear? I have to know how old this child is. And after you find him, come back and tell me that I too might go and worship him. That was a blatant lie. He wanted to go kill him. That was his objective, to kill this rival for his throne, even though it's a newborn infant. See what you, what you got is, this guy is in his 40s. An infant is born, and he's afraid the infant will take his place as king. Okay, remember, who is ruling in Judea, Herod and Idumean, after the Seleucid dynasty? Who's ruling in Egypt? The colonies, Cleopatra's family, okay? And so when Herod seeks to kill the baby, where do they go? Egypt. To Egypt, where a different dynasty is in power that's always been in competition with the Seleucid dynasty and the people in Palestine. It's a political haven 
where the people in charge are not going to turn the baby over to Herod. It is not just coincidence that centuries before the prophet records for us, out of Egypt I've called my son, and Matthew says Jesus went to Egypt, and then, you know, when he's older and Herod's dead, the angel comes to Joseph and says, it's okay, the one who sought to kill your, your, your son is, is dead, it's safe to go back home, and they go to Nazareth. This was to fulfill the prophecy out of Egypt, I've called my son. So, centuries beforehand, God, knowing that the Ptolemies were going to be in power in Egypt at the time Jesus is born in opposition to Herod, announces that I'm going to move my son, a newborn infant, out of the region of the king who wants to kill him into some of his political enemies who won't hand him over in another country. And so in preparation for that, he arranged things when Alexander the Great died. Alexander the Great had no heir. God arranged that. So that the Ptolemies would take over Egypt and the Seleucids would take over Palestine. Okay? The God of history arranged centuries ahead of time during Alexander the Great, 350 AD, BC rather, for there to be a rivalry between two adjoining territories so that Jesus could be taken by Mary and Joseph safely to Egypt and protect them. Okay? But it had to be while Herod was king, because Herod has to be the psychotic paranoid who's going to try to kill the newborn baby and sends his soldiers to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, rather than Bethlehem, to kill these little ones. Okay? All right. So, this is important to recognize. And oh, by the way, it has to also be when Quirinius is governor of Syria and the census is made, because otherwise, you don't take a pregnant woman in her ninth month and travel 70 miles to a different town. You just don't do that. And by the way, we don't have any clue in the Bible that Mary rode on a donkey. All right? But my personal experience in relating to pregnant women in their ninth month is they don't want to ride on a donkey. Okay? So all these pictures of Jesus, you know, Mary riding on the donkey, Joseph leading it, I'm just not buying it myself. Besides which, you might remember when they went to sacrifice the redemption of a firstborn child, they took the offering of four families, two turtle doves instead of a lamb. I don't think they owned the donkey. Now that's my interpretation, okay? All I'm telling you is if you have the this nice manger image of Jesus uh, as a baby and Mary and Joseph there and all the donkeys and cows around them. Eh, wrong picture. Okay? The baby was born and placed in a feed box. Now, how many of you mothers were anxious to let your newborn child remain lying in the barn as long as you could? Yeah. See, the Magi showing up, that's months and months later. The baby's probably a year old almost by that time. And they're in a house. Luke says, or Matthew says they're in a house. Okay? But for the Magi to come, there has to be this period in history where there is free travel, and that's the Roman peace. But it also has to be exactly when Quirinius is governor of Syria in order to get a pregnant woman to travel 70 miles to a city. Let me put that another way. You wouldn't do it for your family, but the government forces you to do it anyway. Right? Have you ever noticed that governments like to push people around? <laughs> That's because simple human beings like to push people around. Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's uh, an old adage. But really the problem is self-centeredness will take power and use it for self-advantage. The Latin term for that is incurvatus su. Curve in on yourself. Okay? And that's our real problem. We become curved in on ourselves. It's all about me. And so what God does is he opens us up. He says, practice hospitality. Welcome the stranger. 
open your arms. I'm sure you've heard this one before. Someone asked Jesus, how much do you love me? And he opened up his arms, said this much, and died. Yeah. Okay. He was not curved in on himself. And that's, that's what it means to be Christ-like. It means not to be curved in on yourself. But to think of others first. Herod did not think of others first. Mary and Joseph actually did think of others first. They thought of Jesus first. Joseph took Mary to be his wife. She was pregnant. He was not the father to do it. His first response was, well, I've got to end this relationship. She loves somebody else. She doesn't want to be my wife. I'm going to divorce her quietly. Not to make a spectacle of her. You know, details in the gospel tell us a lot about Joseph. He was a righteous man. And he was engaged to a righteous woman. Both of them believed God's promises. Both of them were walking in faith. And that's why God chose that couple. Okay? So, this is the time in history where every woman in the people of Israel would always think her first child could in fact be the Messiah. Every time a woman became pregnant for the first time, the thought would run through her mind, my child might be the Messiah. You, see, you and I can't quite grasp that concept. This is going to be a, a very, very, very poor fourth or fifth. Thinking to yourself, my child or my grandchild might become pregnant, which becomes more and more a curse than a blessing, obviously. To be president is not a good thing, I don't think. I mean, yes, someone will do it, but I'm not sure it's a good thing to be president. It might be a necessary evil, but I don't know that it's a good thing. Okay? You look at the presidents of the United States and how many good things have been said about them through the years. Is it really a good thing to be president or not? See, you know, that's just my personal reflection. But if God appoints a person to a task and God sees that it happens, then it's a good thing. Okay? So it might not be good for me, but it still is a good thing. This is a key thought to keep in mind. I don't want to scratch my face. I don't know. <laughs> Um, there are many things that are good things that may not be good for you personally, but they're still a good thing. You may not enjoy them, but they're still a good thing. You know, a simple example is, is if you have a cancerous tumor and you have surgery to remove it. The surgery itself is not fun. It's not a good thing, but it's good for you. Okay? Ever heard that concept? An abscess tooth, you have it pulled, that's a good thing, isn't it? Do you enjoy every moment of it? No, you don't. <laughs> root canal. You ever had a root canal? A root canal is a good thing to have done. Not a good thing to be in the midst of doing it. It's a good thing to have done, completed, over now. You understand what that word means? It means you're no longer having the root canal. It's done. While it's being done, Hopefully they gave you enough shots to fill the nerve in your tooth. Because if they did, you'll know. <laughs> Let me just say this about that. You don't want to know. You want the nerve dead. Okay? I've had one root canal, that's enough. I don't want any more. Okay, things that might be good for you may not be pleasant for you. Remember when you were a child and your mother said, take this medicine. Did your mother give you vitamins? Cod liver oil? Remember cod liver oil? Make sure you got plenty of iron. Okay, if you live far enough north where the sun doesn't shine in the wintertime, your mother will give you cod liver oil to keep you alive. It will be good for you. You will not like it. It will be good for you. 
Okay. Having Herod rule Israel was not good for Israel, but it was necessary. It had to happen for Jesus to be chased out of Bethlehem to Egypt. You see, there was only that one period in history where there was a king paranoid enough to kill a newborn baby and chase him off to Egypt when Herod was king. You see, this is why this timeline matters. God arranged history for these things to be in place at the right moment. And the Pax Romana, as I mentioned, allowed them the gospel to go forward. The temple in Jerusalem had been rebuilt under Ezra and Nehemiah, and then when the Seleucids took over, the king named Antiochus IV, he called himself Antiochus God in the flesh. The Greek name Epiphanes means a manifestation of God. Okay, so when we celebrate Epiphany on January 6th, it's God in the flesh made known to the Gentiles who came and opened their gifts and offered to them, and what did they do? Matthew tells us they bowed down and worshipped him. That's why we call it Epiphany, the revealing of God in the flesh. Okay, well, a couple hundred years before Jesus was born, the, the ruler, Antiochus IV, wanted to declare himself, again, he was a ruler of the Seleucid dynasty in Jerusalem, declare himself to be God in the flesh. And so, in order to manifest his divine character, he went into the temple in Jerusalem and offered a sacrifice. He was not a priest. He was not even an Israelite. And what he offered on the altar in the temple grounds was a sow, a female unclean animal. Every single thing about that sacrifice was a contradiction to God's call to his people, a slap in the face of the Israelites and a slap in God's face. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. When he did that, the people revolted. A man named Matthias was a priest and his sons revolted, and you probably heard of one of them, his name was Judas, they called him Judas the Hammer, which in Aramaic is Maccabees. And this man and his sons from the priestly family led a revolt and overthrew the Seleucids, and for a period of time the Hasmonean ruled in Jerusalem, and then they were replaced by Herod, okay? What they did was they restored the temple, we talked about Hanukkah last week. Cleansed the temple. Went through the process of restoring proper worship in the temple. And then after that, along came the Romans and introduced serial high priests. So you don't even have the real high priest, although the office is filled, it's no longer filled according to God's design. So that when Jesus is born, the high priest is really not the high priest. The office is filled, but the man doing the work is not from the family of Aaron. He's not descended through the high priest line. And yet the position is filled. It has to be fulfilled for there to be the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. One day a year, the high priest entered the inner part of the temple and offered the sacrifice of atonement and sprinkled the blood inside. Now the Ark of the Covenant was drawn at that point in time. Nobody really knows where it is. Nobody knows where it went. Raiders of the Lost Ark notwithstanding. Nobody knows where it is. It's not in a big warehouse somewhere in, in some government complex. Okay. Jesus comes to the temple. For scripture to be fulfilled, that temple had to be there. Now, Herod the Great, in order to win over the people and get them to like him, said, hmm, what can I do that will get all the people on my side? I know, I'll build beautiful cities. And I'll build a city and name it after Caesar. And that's a port. The coast of the Mediterranean, from Lebanon all the way down to the Nile Delta, has no real natural ports. And so Herod the Great built one. 
to go before the city and named it after Caesar in honor of Caesar. This was after he had, you know, said, you let me be king and I'll be a good ally for you. And, and then he built a port city and named it after Caesar. Okay? It's called Caesarea in the Bible. Okay? And he also said, hmm, what else can I do? I know. I can impress the people by restoring the temple to full power and glory and beauty. And so he built a massive expansion of the temple. We talked about that last week. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This was to win the favor of the people. Okay. Jesus is walking out of the temple with his disciples, Holy Week, and they look at the buildings in the temple around them and say, what a marvelous building. Look at this wonderful manifestation of human architectural skill. And what does Jesus say? I tell you, not one of these stones standing here will be left on another. The city is going to be destroyed. The temple is going to be torn down. And then he's challenged the next day by people who say, you're going to destroy this temple? And Jesus said, no, 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 that's not what I said. I said this temple will be destroyed. But here's the deal. You destroy this temple, talking about himself, and in three days I will raise it again. And what's their response? It's taken a dozen years to build this temple, and you're going to build it? In three days? They were pointing at the rock. He was pointing at the rock. And so the temple of God, remember this. When God told the people of Israel to build a place of worship, what did he tell them to build? A tent that moved from place to place. And if you read carefully in Deuteronomy, what is, what is it Moses tells the people? Every year, three times a year, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths, so we call that Passover, Pentecost, and today it's called Sukkot, or the Feast of Booths. Every male is to go to, and the command Moses gave was not Jerusalem. It was the place where God has caused his name to dwell. Which meant wherever he set up the tabernacle. Sometimes it was Silas, sometimes it was Bethel. Other times it was somewhere else. Wherever the tabernacle was that year, everybody was supposed to go to that place. And then when David makes Jerusalem the capital, he wants to build the temple. God never asked them to build the temple. Keep in mind, building the temple was never God's plan to Man's idea. The permanent structure in one place that people will now go to and have pilgrimages to and worship and respect is a revered building instead of the God who is the living God who does not live in a, in a building made with hands. Remember these statements in Scripture? The Lord does not live in a, a building made by hands. Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days I'll rebuild it. And then the New Testament says about you and me, what? We are being built into a temple living stones, right? The answer is yes. That's what it says, right? <laughs> so what had to happen for God to get the people to stop trusting in a physical structure as if the building were their relationship with God? He had to have it destroyed. How did he do that? Now we've moved past Jesus. But the words of Jesus, see all these beautiful buildings, I tell you, the time is coming where one stone will not be left upon another that has not been torn down. And the people of Judah, Judea, keep having this false understanding that the Messiah is going to drive out the Romans. And so they continually build up rebellion. And by the way, some of it's led by the high priest who is not the high priest God appoints. And finally, after Jesus comes, then God lets the high priest be destroyed. He lets the temple be torn down. In 66 B.C., I'm sorry, A.D., the uh, people of Judea revolt. 67 A.D., the, uh, the Romans come in. Titus, you've heard of him? The emperor, Titus? No. The epistle, Titus, different guy. Okay. And what does he do? He comes and destroys Jerusalem. Tears it down. Tears down the temple. 
You go to Jerusalem and go to Rome today, you can see the Arch of Titus. And one of the things on the Arch of Titus is a representation of the plunder they took from Jerusalem when they destroyed the temple. And one of the things shown there is the seven branch lampstand made of gold used to burn incense. But the light the, the, the incense altar and the lampstand, those are shown in the triumphal arch of Titus in Rome. What's not there is the Ark of the Covenant because it's been gone for a long time. But he destroyed the city, tore down the walls, and then they passed an edict after that, a couple decades later, that from that time on, no people of what you and I would call today Jewish descent, in those days of Judean ancestry, were allowed to live in Jerusalem. The Romans literally kicked the Jews out of Jerusalem because they always led rebellions from there. And so the city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. There was no worship going on at the temple. And this was all God's plan to complete the clear statement that Jesus has come, the Messiah has come, the real king of Israel is here, the true temple of God, not built with hands, exists. You don't need the city anymore. And then we come to the revelation of St. John. And what does John tell us in the revelation Jesus gave him? It's actually the revelation of Jesus to St. John. What does he say? I saw the heavenly Jerusalem coming down. The real Jerusalem. There is a temple there. It's God himself. And there's no day and night there. And there is a wall around this temple, around this city. And its foundation stones are the 12 tribes of Israel. And each gate is a pearl. On each, each of the 12 gates is the name of one of the 12 apostles. So what do you have there? The real Jerusalem is not made with stone. It's the people of God, the living stone. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus said. Otherwise, I would have told my disciples to fight. But see, this is what we see then as we move past Jesus dying and rising again. And by the way, real quick review of Holy Week. First day of the week, God rides into Jerusalem and there is light. Let there be light. And here he comes, the son of David. The light of the world enters the city. First day of the week. Okay? And he separates the light from the darkness. He goes into the temple and chases out those who are exchanging money for profit, not for worship, those who are selling animals and deceiving and cheating others. And the light is separated from the darkness. The darkness has nothing to do with the light. And so Jesus pushes them out of the temple. If, if you really want to do this, go back to Genesis chapter 1 and then get out the account of Holy Week. The easiest way to do that, by the way, is to get um, the... Um, Harmony of the Gospels by Phillips. What he does is he takes the four Gospels and he kind of puts them all together to make a single story. Now, I say that because what you do then is you get the days of the week and Holy Week laid out. That's not really the best way to do that because each of the four Gospels was written to accomplish a specific thing in the purpose of the Holy Spirit. So to take them all and push them together, you kind of lose that purpose. But for the sake of doing the work of God in the fullness of time and the recreation of the world, you know, the light coming into the darkness, take Holy Week and Creation Week and put them together. Okay? It is not good for man to be alone, they say. I will make a helper suited to him. And what is Jesus saying to his disciples Thursday night, which technically is then Friday in the calendar of the people of Israel? Don't be afraid. I'm not going to leave you too long. I'm going to get a place ready for you. So we can be together. It's not good for man to be alone. Then on Friday, he creates his bride, the church, by a spear that goes between the ribs. Picking up anything here? 
Would he not take out the side of Adam? Hmm. Maybe, just maybe, just maybe, the book is consistent. Okay. And so in the process, what we see then is the bride of Christ is created through the death of the groom. And they are no longer two, but one. The theology in the scripture is so blatant and yet so subtle that we often miss most of it. Okay? And that's that's part of what we're looking at then with Holy Week and Jesus creating the work of a new creation. What did God do on the sixth day? He finished his work, and on the seventh day he rested. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. The new creating work is done, and then on the seventh day he rested in the tomb. And on the first day of the new week, the eighth day, the beginning of the new creation, he rose from the dead. And new life enters the world. And a new creation is found in God's people, the bride of Christ, the church. But the wedding banquet hasn't happened yet. That's coming up. Okay? John the Baptist, the last of the prophets. Six months before Jesus is conceived, Elizabeth conceived John. How did this happen? We have an elderly couple whom everybody has said they'll never have kids, they're too old, she's barren. And God says, no, she's not. I was waiting for six months before Jesus comes. She's not barren. It's just not the right time. And then he comes to Zechariah and says, now's the right time. And your wife is going to have a baby. A little boy named him John. Zechariah says, hey, I'm not buying it. God says, ask you to buy it. I told you to name him John. Shut up. Okay, that's not what he said. <laughs> what he said was, you can't talk for the next nine months because you didn't believe what I told you. Can you imagine what would happen if every time somebody didn't believe what God told them, no one could talk for the next nine months? I <laughs> <laughs> like that, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. But you see, this is this is it. The silence of Zacharias, or Zachariah, Zacharias Hebrew, Zacharias is Greek. The silence of Zachariah is deafening. For nine months, the man could not say anything because he didn't believe the word of God. Now, when he went home, his wife became pregnant, he believed. But you see, that's different. Full nine months, he didn't get to say anything. But once the child is born, He begins to talk after he writes down the words, his name is John. And then he starts talking, and then he sings a song. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And raised up a horn of salvation, a cup of salvation for us. What's he doing? He's proclaiming that God has sent the light into the world. The Messiah is coming, and this one is going to go before the face of God's people and prepare the way for the chosen one, the Messiah. Okay, so we have this period in history where this priest has to go into the temple to offer this, the incense for the sacrifice, and he's in there longer than normal, and people are beginning to wonder what's wrong, so he had to come out yet. Comes out and can't talk. And he makes signs, and they understand he's seen an angel. Okay. It had to be six months before Mary conceived the child that Elizabeth conceived the child. So it had to be the right moment where God arranged for the casting of the lot to decide which priest went in to sacrifice. Who's in charge of the casting of lots when it happens in the people of Israel? always God. After Jesus ascends back to the Father, before Pentecost, the disciples get together, Acts chapter 1, and Peter says, 
you know Judas has gone to his appointed place, but as scripture says, his office must be filled by another, like another take his place. So we're going to have to get another guy to be apostle number 12. We came up with the criterion. One who has been with us since the beginning, the baptism of John. And now suddenly the baptism of John becomes a part of the 12 apostles who are the foundation stones of the city walls in the heavenly Jerusalem. And the gates of pearl, 12 and 12, okay? The 24 elders around the throne, worshiping the Lamb. You've got to have that 12th man, or the rest of the vision of the true heaven is invalidated. Before the Holy Spirit is poured out, the methodology is casting lots. We talked a little bit about this previously. In the voters' assembly, you're going to be considering a call list, and down the road at some point in time after the appropriate number of interviews have been completed and the process is at that point, you will then hold a ballot and elect a pastor to come and serve you. And that will be your pastor elect. Until that pastor says yes, and then comes in and installed in his office and becomes your pastor, or declines and then you find another pastor elect. But what you're not doing, not that you can't, what you're not doing is narrowing it down to two people and then saying, we'll cast a lot and God will decide. Could you do that? Sure. But before Pentecost, God has guaranteed he will answer his people by the casting of lots. And so the disciples nominate two people, and now it's two men to replace Judas, narrowed it down to two, and then they cast the lots. And what do they do when they cast the lots? They let God decide. Who called the twelve apostles in the first place? None of them volunteered to follow Jesus. Jesus called them all. And so the, the apostles don't get to pick the eleven, don't get to pick number twelve. God picks him. After Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all of God's people, there's no longer a need for casting lots because the Holy Spirit's working in all of us as God's baptized people. We can vote and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us because he's promised to do that. What does is, what is Jesus say? If you ask the Father anything in my name, Dear Lord, lead us to the right pastor to call for this congregation. What is God going to do? He's going to lead you to the right pastor to call. He said so. God told you that. I didn't. God told you that. So you can vote. Because you've asked God to do it. And God says, yeah, I want to lead you to the right pastor. And you can vote, and I'll guide your voting. And if that man turns down the call, guess what? I was teaching you something so that you would say, okay, that wasn't the right man, but we're still letting God guide the process. We'll keep going. Oh, we failed. We didn't find the right man the first time. God doesn't love us anymore. Really? God loves you with an everlasting love. Whether you call the right pastor the first time, in your mind, doesn't matter. You are loved by God. Okay? So you ask him to guide you and lead you to the right man, and then you pray and the Holy Spirit guides you. And it could be the Holy Spirit says, yes, I guided you to call that man. Because that pastor in that congregation needed to have a call come to him so that he could ask himself, what am I doing here? How do I serve God in this place? I was using you to work the good of the church in another congregation somewhere else, and you are my servants to do my good in the world. And I said, call that man, because that parish needed to deal with their pastor as a pastor. And until he got a call to another congregation, they weren't doing that. So I did my work through you. Thank you very much. Did you know I was doing my work through you? Sure you did. You prayed that I would guide you in the voting. So you knew I guided you. Right? Isn't that how you looked at that when the last pastor declined call? Sure you did. You just didn't realize it until then. I'm serious about that. You actually realized it. You just didn't know that you realized it because nobody verbalized it for you. But you said, well, there must be a reason he didn't take the call, didn't you? 
See? We don't know enough. I don't know enough. We keep seeking God's guidance and wisdom, and he comes and gives it, all right? And you can never know the word of God well enough. I continually read something in scripture, and I'm going, ah, I didn't see that before. It was always right there. The words haven't changed. But I never saw it. This is what God does. He guides us in his word. Okay, so the disciples are charged with taking the gospel to the whole world. And what Jesus said is, as he's talking to them about Jerusalem being destroyed and the signs of the heavens and the earth and the end of the age coming, what he tells his disciples is, that kid's in Sunday school, mm -hmm. you're going to pick him up, okay? Because you know what's going on. Right. What he tells them is, I will return. I will come back. I will judge the world at the end of the age. But first, my name must be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Do you remember hearing, boy, I think it was almost two years ago now, about the uh, young man who was convinced that as a Christian, he had to take the gospel message to an island off the coast of India, between India and, and Sri Lanka. It's a very small island, and the native population there speaks a language that no one else speaks. And if anybody comes to their island, they kill them. Remember hearing about this young man? was convinced that he is, his obligation as a Christian was to take the gospel to that group of people on that island. And so he went ashore to that island. And sure enough, they killed him. This island is actually a restricted area because the government authorities all know that if you enter that territory, the population there will kill you. They do it for every foreigner who shows up. Without exception, they always kill the person if the person stays on the island. You can come ashore and they'll come out and threaten you. If you leave, they'll let you leave. But if you stay, they'll kill you. So has the gospel gone to all the world? Is there a place where some people have not yet heard the gospel? With the technology we have available today, I'm finding it pretty hard to believe there are any people groups left that have not been found. It's possible there are a couple. You know, until 50 years ago, there were certainly tribal groups within the Amazon that had never been found or spoken to in a language other than their own language. Most of those have now been found. Aerial photography, satellite images, most of that stuff actually enables us to identify where people live on the planet today. So if the gospel has now gone to all the people in the world, what's left until Jesus comes back? Just his plan. Just his timing. And at just the right moment, Jesus will come back. Paul writes about this to Timothy. In the last days, people will be lovers of self, greedy, not interested in justice, violent. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Just read through it and ask yourself, what that Paul mentions here is not happening in the world today. And then ask yourself, when is the fullness of time? That day, that hour, knows no man, not even the Son, nor the angels in heaven, Jesus said. Just the Father. It's come. I don't know when it is. So, 
This is not a change of topic, but it's going to sound like it to you. What's on your bucket list? You know what a bucket list is? If you don't know what a bucket list is, put your hand up and I'll tell you what it is real quickly. A bucket list is, of course, things you want to do before you pick the bucket. Okay. Um, about, what did you do? Let me think about it. 2014, so that would be just, just a little over five and a half years ago. My wife and I were able to purchase the uh, farm where my mother grew up for my late uncle's estate. And I happened to be going to a, a meeting, a district uh, board uh, meeting was taking place, and uh, there were you know, several people there, and we were just introducing ourselves around the table. And I made the statement, well, I'm Stephen Tide, the pastor in this place, I was pastor, and I said, and as far as things new in our, in our situation, my wife and I just bought the farm. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that phrase mean you purchased a piece of property? Right? But we've taken it to be slang for buying a plot of ground in which you're planted or buried. Okay? Okay. So, a bucket list, because you're going to kick the bucket. What does that mean? It means you kicked out the bucket that was holding you up so that you wouldn't hang by the rope around your neck. That's what it means. Okay? So, sometimes we really don't know what we're talking about when we say things. Just thought I'd help you out. What's on your bucket list? Seriously, what are things you wish to accomplish before you die that you haven't done yet? It's not a rhetorical question. Build a house. Build a house, yeah, okay. Got that one, Pete. <laughs> yeah, finish the house. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ireland. Visit Ireland. Australia. Australia. Yeah. See different parts of the world that you've never been to. Yeah, that, that's, you know, it's a marvelous creation God put together to just see it. Um, a couple of people I know have been to New Zealand and told me it's just an amazing place. And, and, you know, New Zealand is much like Hawaii in certain ways. There are um, nine climate zones in the world. Seven of these exist in the islands of Hawaii, including Arctic Tundra. Okay? Didn't know that was in Hawaii, did you? Pardon me? Yeah. You know the, the observatory on the top of the mountain where there's the clear sky? Well, that's high enough altitude that it's Arctic Tundra. Okay. Yeah. Visiting places. Seeing family members that you haven't seen in a while. But the primary objective for the Christian church is to take the gospel to those who don't have it, to share the good news with those who haven't learned it, to be part of the church worldwide. One of the things I would love to do before I die is to travel to a place where the church is persecuted to give support by my physical presence to the persecuted Christians in that community. Not financial presence, not resources, but to physically stand there and pray with them. That's what I'd like to do. I don't know that it will happen outside of this country, but inside this country it's going to happen easily. But to recognize that throughout the church, throughout the world, there isn't just one holy Catholic church. Just one. And by the way, Ignatius of Antioch was the first guy to use the word Catholic to describe the church, okay? For those of you who keep track of those things, it was around 180 AD that the word Catholic was first used. All right? Not a big deal, but sometimes these things just pop into my brain while I'm talking about church. <laughs> And so there is one holy church throughout the world, made holy through the blood of Christ, made holy through baptism by the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're part of it. So that anywhere you go in the world, there are fellow believers in Christ there with you. So I'm just inviting you to think about this. The next time you go on vacation, ask yourself, where can I go to find some Christians that I wouldn't otherwise meet and just ask them, 
how the faith is being treated in their community. And let them talk. And by asking that question, you automatically support them. That's just my thought. It might not be on your list, no big deal. Okay? But ultimately, the greatest item on the bucket list is to die and go to heaven, and then rise again. Okay? But see, the rising again can't be on the bucket list because you can't do it till after you die. Okay? <laughs> so on your bucket list, you can't have go to heaven. Unless you want God to take you bodily, in that case, put it on yours. Right. Well, I think we've reached the end of our appointed time for the day, and uh, we're going to close with a brief word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that you indeed have, at the right moments in time, given us the birth of Christ, new birth for your spirit, to be your children. Enable us to walk in faith and to share that gift with others that they too might be part of the one holy body of Christ, your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your attention and time. And uh, those of you who are voters of the congregation, I'm going to assembly tomorrow.